Life is a journey made up of experiences, some good, some bad, some happy, some sad. We may all be different, but we are connected through the fact that no matter who we are, our stories all have hills and valleys. And so tonight, we dedicate this episode to those who have been to the precipice and were thankfully pulled back. Welcome to SimSoul Sessions. Everybody and welcome to the show. Please remember that during this show, you can join in our conversation tonight by using the hashtag SimSoulSessions. Well, tonight we are talking to the very special Kerry Ann Kiki Lewis Toms, who you may better know, as I said, as Kiki. Her story is dramatic and it's moving, and her strength is inspiring, and I cannot wait to talk to her. Before that, though, as we will do each week, we are checking in with some of our faves from previous seasons to see how things have been since they were last on the show with us. I'm very happy now to reconnect with Chantel Brown, who was the guest on our very last show of our last season. Chantel, you will remember, lost her mom in a fire last year, and her siblings were displaced as a result of the host burning to the ground. Well, Chantel joined us to tell her story and for us to help her on her healing journey. Unaware that our sponsors, Grace Foods, alongside Digicel, were waiting in the wings to deliver a Christmas miracle. Well, $1.1 million later, Chantel was able to see how she could rebuild the home and start rebuilding her life by getting the counseling she and her family so desperately needed. Chantel joins us now. Hi, Chantel. Hi, Simone. How are you? I am very well. It is so good to talk to you. I know we're trying to make a link via Zoom, but we're having some issues, and that's okay. So we'll do it this way. Catch us up. Tell us how you've been. What's going on? I have been well. Giving God thanks for all his wonderful mercies. I have been well. My siblings, they are... They are slowly picking up the pieces. They're doing well themselves. Okay. Tell us what has been happening um, since you sat here. What's been happening with the house? Where are you now? The house. From Grace, from Grace Company and Digital has been tremendous help for us. The house. I am at the point of getting the electrical installation done. I have reached, we have completely roofed the house, Yay. so that's done. Yes, we have. We have, we have managed to completely flush all, in, both inside and outside, and all we have left to do now is to complete the rendering and getting all the infrastructures that have already been thankfully paid for by your general sponsors. Oh, God bless you, Grace Foods. God bless you, Digicel. God bless you, Grace Financial. You did that. Um, as for you and your own journey, when you were here, um, you told us the words that were keeping you, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans for you. You are working because through your life. grief. Um, I know the counselor from Grace has reached out to you guys and you are yet to start your work, but tell me how you've been doing on that journey of processing everything that happened, it was so much on you when you were here last time. How's that been going? It, 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 it has been an uphill battle, one that I constantly fight every day, knowing that in the midst of everything, God is with me. He is definitely with me. It has been, I've, I've, been, I've been able to share my story with others, mm -hmm. and in the midst of everything, find that strength and, uh, and allow them to pull from the strength that I have garnered through all of this. Yeah. And your siblings, your sister, um, your older sister, as well as your two younger siblings, how are they? They are doing okay. The young son, four-year-old Malachi, it's the hardest with him, as I had shared before. But he's slowly adjusting to prospects of how things are now. He used to go but 
he he's recovering slow. Okay. All right. I don't I don't want us to lose you. So the host should be when the host is finished, then your your older sister will be able to have your younger siblings back in that space and they'll be together again. How soon do you think that's going to happen? I think it 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 it, it is. It is in close proximity to us now, but given the help that we've gotten, that again I'm extremely grateful for from Beauty Cell and Grace, we are still, I am still out on labor costs, so I am slowly trying to garner the funds to keep the work going as it relates to labor costs. Okay. Okay. Well, we, we, we're going to keep you squarely um, in our thoughts, in our prayers, and we're going to follow up with you because um, we want to see you when it's all done and we want to be there when the family gets back yes, darling, together. Thank you, Chantel, and all the best to you. All right, when we get back, everybody, we introduce you to tonight's guest. I'm so excited to talk to her. We'll be right back. More SimSoul sessions right after this. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. Our guest tonight has been to hell and back. And how her little frame has, has withstood so much trauma, testament to her strength and to her faith. Kerry, Kiki Lewis-Toms joins me now. Um, Hi, Sue. So happy to have you in this chair. <laughs> I am happy to I'm be so here. happy to have you in this chair. Full circle, man. Okay. okay, this is full circle. Full we were circle. just talking yeah. and you said to me, um, no, you tell me what you said. Um, that I've been in your presence since the age of 24, and I'm now 42. That's how long. It's a long you. time. That's a long time. Um, <laughs> and it's been, a, it's been a, an interesting journey. Yeah. So now that you said that, I can say that I am so proud of how far you've come Thank and how you. much you've grown Thank you. in that time. Because I have a little bit of insight as to where you're coming from. Yes. And where your land now is just, God is just amazingly good. Mm -hmm. So let's start, let's go back a little bit for the benefit of our, our viewers and start from the time you were growing up. You grew with mom and dad. Yes. A very interestingly, kind of tumultuous relationships mm -hmm. on both sides. On both sides. That's yeah. helped to kind of shape the trajectory of the rest of your life. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about growing up. Um, essentially, just a dysfunctional home. Um, Daddy had severe temper problems um, and I think mommy was just trying her best to hold it down but um, there's something that happens when a child just latches on to a parent so like how they always say boys love mommy and girls like I'm a daddy's girl mm -hmm. to the core so um, I think very early I learned a lot of forgiveness through him because I loved him unconditionally but it wasn't always a bit of roses because he he had a really nasty temper um, and later on I found out that it was due to him having psychotic rages, which I didn't know before. So his psychotic rage would have been triggered by any and everything, and mommy and I would have been the Time. punching bag, bag, so to speak. So, um, you know, I've, I've been slapped with the broadside of a machete because he just was in a rage. Like, I'd have chop marks in my furniture, you know, at home based on that. Um, I've, you know, seen him, and it's, it's, it's a very delicate balance for me because when any time I'm talking about my story, I have to be cognizant of my mother as well, yes. who's a very private yes. person, yes. you know, extremely private. So I always try to protect that, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, my, my, my beating with daddy escalated. I started fighting back really early, <laughs> but Pranganat switch was his, 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 his weapon of choice, so to speak, you know, his, his tool. Um, and, you know, whenever he'd go off, he'd just go right off. And um, it escalated until, like, the age of 15 when we had our last brawl. It was a brawl, like, lift me up, slam me on a piece of board that mom used to sleep with for her back, broke it in two, and it was war. And I was at the point where I was like, all right, cool, guess what? Either you're going to kill me, I'm going to kill you, or this can't work anymore. Same you just right. cannot wear, yeah, so just couldn't manage. What about your relationship with your mom? Because you guys used to both. Yeah, I mean, so it's so it's so difficult for a mother to know how much she is sacrificing, but yet still see a child who is just completely adoring her father. And as a child, you're not going to know the dynamics of what's happening in between both parents, you know? Um, but mommy was very, as I said, very private, very conservative, and I just grew up a lot seeing my mommy shed a lot of tears, mm. a lot of tears. And my whole thing was, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect me, and I'm going to protect you as best as I can. Yeah. So you left home at 15? Yeah. Because you said, Daddy's either you or me. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
by the age of 18, mm -hmm. you were in jail. Yes. In yeah. the States. Yeah. Like, you did not see that coming. But maybe this is a manifestation of everything of else. Of everything, yeah. W what happened? Um, so, essentially, um, during that phase between 15 and 18, it gets a little blurry, you know? Um, but... I was approached to carry drugs to the States. Um, and my whole thing was, I was tired of moving around from place to place. So I did, I made a one run, make a little money. I said, oh, this is how this works. Okay, well, I'm gonna try this again. However, um, I had second thoughts about it and I was like, no, nah, this is not what I want to be doing. But by that time, I was kind of a little too late to backtrack. So I made the trip and I was used as a decoy. And so, therefore, that started the whole journey of my jail time. So you you were carrying, but you were the decoy because yes. somebody else yes, bigger a bigger, was carrying. a bigger shipment was so carrying. So they held on to you while. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you ended up you ended up in jail. In jail, and then a week after I got arrested, I found out I was pregnant with my first child, at the age of nineteen, because I had just just celebrated my nineteenth birthday. So I turned nineteen in the November, and by the February, I was arrested. <laughs> I'm really trying to pace this interview, but it's, you know, life is coming at you at, as fast as this interview is, is going. So yeah. you land in jail and one week later you're yeah. pregnant. Yeah, I found out I was pregnant. For my 15-year-old boyfriend. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure the question, like what, what is happening in your head at that point, Kiki? Not, not much. Um, I don't know, Sim. I, I think I'm wired differently. I'm wired very differently. So my mother and being an only child, you kind of learn really early. You can't blame people when you do things wrong because you're the only one. I remember one point trying to blame my cat for breaking my mother's lamp because I couldn't, I couldn't blame nobody else. I said, mommy, I made up some ridiculous story. And my mother is looking at me like, so you learn pretty early as an only child, pay the consequences. So anytime I'm in the wrong, I just have to deal with the consequences. And anytime life is throwing me curveballs, I have to find a way to deal with the consequences. My danger zone is I deal with things in a delayed way. Mm. Yeah. So that's my danger zone. So as I'm, I'm like that type of person that you want to have around you because I'm a soldier. But when it's sinking, then that is when. <laughs> She's not lying. Yeah, you yeah. Know, Aaron um, would say you're not wrong. Yeah, I'm yeah, not. Yeah. But when it sinks in, it's always a delayed reaction. And then that's when now I really have to push through to catch myself. So how long did it take you to, to realize I'm 19 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm in a foreign country. Yeah. I'm behind bars. Yeah. I'm here for two years. Two years. Two yeah. years. Yeah. What am I going to do? Never had that thought. Never reach you. The moment they said to me, you're pregnant. That was my entire focus. My entire focus was this child is going to be born and this child is going to be born healthy. And that was my entire focus. And that almost did not happen. Almost did not happen. All right, we're going to tackle that. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a break. Kiki, let me tell you. I was going to say she should write a book, but she has. <laughs> she has. Um, I'll tell you more about this amazing young woman on the other side of this break. Be right back. We are back with you, everybody, and back talking to Kiki. Um, left you before the break, where she realizes in jail now that she is pregnant. Um, and you say that's your primary focus now, yeah. is to make sure that your child is, is well. Yeah, ma'am. But delivery, Kiki, was hell. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, and, and it's so interesting because jail was a whole new ballpark. Right. So essentially, the backstory of that is I was eight months pregnant and there was something happening at the jail um, and they were moving pr prisoners out. They were going to transfer us. But one thing that I knew at that age was, especially I think from what to expect when you're, what to expect when you're expecting mm -hmm. is you're not supposed to travel past a certain point. And I was saying to them, hey, yo, I can't move like no matter what to do. Anyway, it, it escalated and they were telling me that I needed to pack my stuff. So Kerry, being Kerry, decides to take a chair and put it in the hallway where the men have to pass through to go see their, their guests, their visitors. And one thing you don't want to mess with is men, prisoners, and them visiting time. But I tell them I'm not moving. I need somebody else because this picnic have a bond. And I not no questions about it. Anyway, what are the odds of the same night after this whole uproar, quote unquote, in the jail, I head into labor? 
And um, so, you know, they rushed me to the hospital. I'm still handcuffed to the bed while in labor, by the way, because they have to ensure you are about to give birth before they pull you. So shackled at the ankle, shackled on, you know, hands and stuff. And once you're in active labor is when they'll remove the cuffs. Wow. And after I gave birth to JP, I ended up with preeclampsia. So my pressure skyrocketed, which means now that it was so high and it was lasting for so long that they were worried that I was going to be brain dead. So I'm consciously hearing them having conversations over me and I'm like, oh my God, I feel fine inside. I mean, my head is throbbing, I, I'm not coherent, but I'm good. Um, and I kept, I remember any time I came back to being coherent, I was asking them to turn on my side and they're like, no, you have to lie on your back. And it seemed there was a point when I just couldn't manage. I was like, I felt like this was it. Mm -hmm. Turned on my side, fell asleep, knocked out. And the following day, my pressure went down. So, wow. yeah. Yeah. How old are you show you now, Kiki? Oh, God, that's only the tip of the iceberg. And then, <laughs> after you had JP, thankfully, all went mm -hmm. well, but he, you're still in jail, so you had to... Yeah, so I had to give him up, um, which was a whole other, you know, story unto itself. Yeah. So you, you were away from him for the first... How first, many? I think, like, maybe, what, nine to ten months yeah. of his life? Yeah. Yeah. And you came and home so, to live with his grandparents. Yeah, and then I came home, and I came home, ironically, the night of my dad's nine night. Kiki, you just give me a chance to tell the story. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> you have JP. Yeah. This is now the year 2000. Yeah. And you lose your father, mm -hmm. tragically. Yeah. So you were still incarcerated. Yeah. And you get a call that he's... Yeah. And I went into immediate denial. Denial and rage. Because for me, growing up how I grew up, Anger and rage are my go-to. Like, I don't necessarily have words, which is why I've received the title over the years as being a hothead. Like, because if I can't find my words, then I, I, I explode. Um, and I just remember this lady saying to me that my father is dead and he died in a car accident. And I was like, you're a fool. <laughs> That's not in Kyanga. Not in Kyanga, so. And then I came home on the night of his nine night and I went numb. Numb. N-U-M-B, So it took out of prison, <laughs> come back to Jamaica, the first night yeah. is to your father's night. Night night, yeah. Yeah, and then had to bear him the following day and did the eulogy and I was pissed. So I pushed through the eulogy with anger and no one understood what that was and that was just my whole MO. Was, what, was the, what was that rage? You were mad I was that he mad. had gone because I you didn't mad. get a chance to say Yeah, I was goodbye. livid. I was livid at everything. I was livid at... I was like, how? You know, like almost wanting to blame him when it wasn't even his fault. I was just, I was so shocked. Yeah. 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 Well, you said something to me a while ago when yeah. we were talking that I'm still trying to process. Yeah. Because I, I talk to all my guests before they land, no matter how well I know them, before they land on the set. And you said after our discussion on the phone the other day, you had a revelation. Which was, I think, and not that I would have wanted my dad not to be here, but the fact that he's a parent that died, I think God had orchestrated it that way because he knew that I loved him. He never had to question that. But I'm happy that he died and not my mom because my mom would have probably died without knowing how much I love her. And in this moment, I'm saying, all right, Daddy, I love you, I miss you, but I'm happy that mommy's here. Yeah. Because now you and your mom have worked through and are working through. Yeah, still working through because a lot of the issues that I have to work through and push through are based on how I was raised and a lot of her influence. Because here's the thing, as a parent, I'm a mother of four boys, mm -hmm. but there's a gender difference. So who would have the most responsibility in the house would be Denver, because they're looking to him to see how a man should act. I'm doing the same thing with my mother. So when you have a mother-daughter relationship, always remember that as much as she might be a daddy's girl, she's still subconsciously watching how mommy is processing, watching what mommy is doing. And so I think that's where we have a lot of pressure in the same gender kind of, you know, parenting. So boys, parent, fathers will always have, have it just a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. They have to really hold firm because the boys are watching. And for mothers, the same thing with their daughters. Yeah. So in that post-daddy passing period, yeah. it gave you an opportunity to bond with to, my mommy. To bond with yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. And get to know more about her. She's still very private, you know, but she's, she's a gorgeous soul. Um, so you carry this around for years. Yeah. All the anger. Yeah. And all the rage. Yeah. Came Smoke to a head. and drink and had to just escape. In 2007. Yeah. Were you just 
Yeah, crashed. I think I think I crashed a little bit before 2007 because 2007 was when Zan was born. But my crash came earlier, where I just couldn't do it anymore. I was just in Daddy's room one day, and it just hit me. Like this is like two, three years later after his death, and it just hit me that he's no longer here. And it was like, whoop, like that that whole three years that I was, you know, everyone would think that I'm holding it together. They'd see me angry, they'd see the behavior, but they wouldn't understand why. Mm -hmm. And then in one moment, it just came. I left my job, I cut my hair off. I was just like, I was just done, done. I was up to like two scandal bags full of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I remember when I was leaving home, I had to take out two scandal bags full of just cigarette boxes. I was just, I was done. I was done, and Daddy used to smoke. And so for me, anytime I smoked, it made me feel connected to him during that period. Yeah, man. Well, you were done. I was done. But thanks be to God, we were not <laughs> done with you. Um, yeah. So when we come back, we're gonna talk about um, what happened after she thought she was done, but she never done, mm. and how something pivotal would happen to change her course yeah. and direction in her life. More on Simso Sessions after this. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're catching up with Kiki about the story of her life. And boy, what a story. It, it, does it get easier to tell? It does. It does? It does. Okay. It does. See, that is why I do the show. Yeah, it does. Because when people talk, it yeah. helps them. And it helps others who are watching to realize that they're not, they're not alone, alone in their struggle. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, there's a level of growth and acceptance. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm fully aware that I had to have this story to be able to help. Like I think in everything that you go through in life, whatever challenges you're going through, it's not for you alone. Girl. You know what I mean? It's for you to grow through Girl. it so you can help others Girl. to grow through it. You know what I mean? That's it. So for me, I'm just like, all right, I went through it, I survived. The fact is I survived. But one key point to note about healing, and this is why a lot of people stay away from healing, is healing is painful. You have to confront. Because it's a lot of acceptance, a lot of layers, a lot of pain that you have to go through. And when persons start feeling that emotional pain and they feel like they're about to come unhinged, they pull back mm -hmm. and then find other escapes, mm -hmm. you know, whether you it be sex, drugs, it. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you honestly have to stop yeah. to go. And my thing is, if you went through the pain of it happening, you can go through the pain of healing. Yeah, yeah. Just wrap your mind around that. Yeah, powerful thought. Tessan tells me the only way out is through. Yeah. And so the only way it through is. is through. So you just yeah. have to face the just, ugliness head just on. Just go with it. Manage it and go through it. Um... So when we when we talked during our pre-interview, I asked mm -hmm. you about the three three defining three most defining moments of your life. Yeah. I wasn't surprised when you mentioned the death of your dad. Right. I wasn't surprised when you mentioned the birth of your boys. Yeah. I was surprised when you mentioned being hired at fame. Really? Among your top three. Yeah, man. That also, was. Also, girl. So of course I'm now sinking in the pressure, and I've left my job. Um, you know, life is just upside down right now and um, I ended up working at hedonism for a short stint um, because for me that was the only place I could go that could have provide food and shelter <laughs> and I never had to pay rent and they were paying me uncomfortable experience for me because I'm still very you know conservative um, but while their fame came down for a property party and I remember being interviewed by Paula and the following day, as they were leaving, Paula says, so when you coming in for an audition? And I thought she was joking. And Francois says, what, she's interested? She'd be interested in working at Fame? And so they said, yeah. And they said, okay, we'll come in for an audition. And I was like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> so Rudy dress up in our hipster and our halter back, come to good, good RJ. I remember the day. In a big, bright red cap to the side. And I remember Susie looking at me like, yeah, I go. Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> anyway, so um, I go into the interview or the audition and completely for me, crash and burn. Because Rudy speak at 100 miles per hour. Zine, so I don't know how Rudy and or, uh, Rudy are going. Rudy is, is herself, by the way, yeah. as a rude girl, just no, in case no, you're. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> anyway. uh -huh. um, and then I got called into a second audition, a third audition, and about eight auditions later. Francois made the announcement in a staff meeting that I was the newest member of Eight. Fame. Yeah, because he said, when I thought I was, because for me, remember, I'm now a trained pessimist, somewhat based on all my experiences, you know? So while I'm there, I'm thinking that I'm 
strong, I'm doing horribly, but he's noticing that I keep getting better. And I remember him calling me one day and I, my message on my phone at that time was, if you're calling me with negativity, blah, 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 like some weird message, you could tell I was depressed. <laughs> and Francois said in the sweetest way, um, Carrie, <laughs> You know, I don't know what's going on, but, you know, you might want to change that voice message. I mean, just a suggestion because you don't know who's calling on exactly. the other end. And that was the relationship that I had with Francois yeah. all the time that I was there. So. He was just that guiding force. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For boss man, I go into boss man office and I say, boss man, and this is boss man. <sighs> yes, Carrie. <laughs> It's not you alone him to do that too, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was, you know. It was a thing. I wish we could find Francois to tell him what, I mean, he's been such an important yeah. Um, yeah. role model in a lot of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. But he I was, you, you tell me that you wish you could tell him how life-changing his impact on you was. Yeah. So why don't you just tell him no? Can we bring him up? <laughs> Francois! <laughs> Hi! Good Francois evening! Francois Hi, ladies. How are you doing? Hi, boss man. I am doing very well. Okay, so oh, she's awesome. still calling you boss man so many years later. I, he's my boss man. <laughs> he is. I love um, him endlessly. Did you, hear, did you hear what she just said a while ago? I did, yes. You, you put her through eight auditions. Tell me why you didn't give up. <laughs> the thing is, the personality that we saw, going all the way back to the hedonism property party, there was a personality there that was really very exciting that could fit in with fame. She didn't have the broadcasting experience, but she had an attitude and a drive, um, which was really unbelievable. And part of the problem was that she was speaking too fast. So we had to find a way to slow her down. Because if, if you think she speak fast, no. Correct. Yeah, it was a gallop. It was on gallop. Oh, boy. <laughs> but, 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 but I'm what glad... What was good... Yes. What was good was the drive, as I said. She wanted to, to learn everything. She wanted to try everything. And that is always encouraging when you're trying to bring in young people and influence them to appreciate the business that they're in. And so while it took a while... It was worth it. <laughs> um, when you sit here now and you hear her say that you are one of the, the, the persons who helped her to get what was then a life being derailed back on track, did you know that? I did not know that until much long after. I mean, like when she was doing the book. Um, that's when, you know, you really get an appreciation of what it meant to her, but um, over the years, it was really a, a, a mentoring relationship. As, as she said, we used to have long chats, mm -hmm. talk about all kinds of things, not only broadcasting, mm -hmm. but yeah. life in general mm -hmm. and how to navigate certain things. Um, so there, there's a special relationship. Yeah. And when you see her now, Looking like she's all, it seems to me that she, like she thinks she's a big woman at this point. I mean, uh, I was a part of that journey, so I know we used to butt heads too, me and Kiki, <laughs> inside of that office. Um, but, but now she seems, and I don't know if you can tell me, like she's coming to a sense of self that is, um, it's beautiful to see. Yes, because she's, she has made a journey. Um, and yes, yeah, she's a big woman now. Uh, she has her family, she has her children to raise. She has had different job opportunities, advancing herself from radio to TV, to production, to all kinds of things, because she wants to keep moving forward. And that is so encouraging to see. Yeah. So thank Kiki, you. what what do you want to say to him? Um, I just, from my heart, I just want to say thank you. I think, um, Francois, yourself, Norma Brown, Bill, Dene, like all of these, you know, I call icons, veterans, have certainly paved the way for the younger generation. And you were never at all um, selfish with the craft. You know what I mean? Like you held us to high standards. And for me, Francois was just a breath of fresh air in my life because he believed in me. 
You know, like I was so used to the labels and so used to the judgment and so used to the negativity and people like just automatically tearing me down. And I remember even when I shared with Francois about my jail experience and he said, I have you. I have you. You just need to do what you need to do. I can't save you, but I have you. Mm. And um, I just admired that where for me, anytime I'm around boss man, it's just like, I, I just love him. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I'd be the little one, hitch up side of him at the fame road party. Yeah. As you know, just wanted to make sure boss man is okay. Boss man, you're good. Boss man, you're all right. And then, of course, anytime he tried to get me out there to do anything, I'd always pass it on to Deidre because <laughs> I'd still work through <laughs> that nerve, you know? So Francis was like, come on, you are here for a reason. Take the microphone. Deidre, Deidre. <laughs> but it's been, it's been a journey. And I just want to say um, thank you, boss man, for being so open, so non-judgmental, and for being an amazing human being and an amazing broadcaster who has molded and shaped so many of us um, to the point where anywhere we go, anytime we speak, anytime we approach our job, you could tell where the training came from. Hey. And I, was just, I was just humbled to be a part of that. So we, we, we still here, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not under the umbrella, but we still ride or die for that brand. You got it, boss? Yeah. Proud of you, proud Thank of you. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much, Mr. Sanjus. Boss man, as everybody still calls you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you are just such an amazing person, and it doesn't surprise me that you had that impact yeah. on Kiki. Thank you so much, Francois. And, and Francois says he's proud of you, but there are a lot of other people who are as well. Uh -huh. uh, and we linked up with some of them, and here they are. <laughs> Laurie, run tape. <laughs> Hi, mommy. We both oh. came up far away. I just wanted to let you know. I love Khalil. you. I really appreciate you. <laughs> really appreciate everything you've done for me. That's my baby. But I might be one oh. of the few who knew you before you could talk. And all I have to say is that it's been an amazing four decades of seeing your growth, your resilience, your ability to pick yourself back up after small adversities. I am so proud of you, and I am wishing the best for you in all your future endeavors. Thank you for always being there for me. Thank you for always providing for us. Thank you for being the best mom that a son could ever ask for. I love you, mom. I want to thank you for being you, for being true, for always being real, genuine, and accepting me um, with all of my weird idiosyncrasies and not being judgmental. Um, you are somebody that I can be absolutely vulnerable with. I think you're probably one of the few people that I've allowed to see me cry. <laughs> um, and and I, I have no inhibitions around you. So I want to put a pause on my world today to hand you a rose, a rose of appreciation and love and say I thank you for actually choosing me to accompany you on your journey of knowing self. I once heard that knowing others is intelligence, but knowing thyself is pure wisdom. And I want to say continue, keep going on your journey, keep trusting in that internal source that you have. Trust your gut feelings continually, and I wish you nothing but the best. Before I call you my wife, I call you my best friend and that you still are You're the closest and most dearest person to me and I love and appreciate you. I just want to wish you many more blessings in your life, many more achievements, many more accomplishments and just want to encourage you to stay strong, right? I know it's rough at times but we both will, will succeed with your resilience, your beauty, your energy, you will succeed. I just wanted to take the time out today to let you know that I love you, I love you a lot. And I'm really thankful for everything that you have done for me and are still doing, even though at times it can be hard and you are going through stuff yourself but due to our love for each other and the connection that we have we still ensure that each other well-being is still good and i know that i haven't really been texting or really been around as much 
as you would want me to be, or as I'm gonna want me to be. But I just want to say that I'm thankful for everything that you have done and for you bringing me here. And I hope that everything within the next years to come will bring beautiful righteousness and this prosperity and well-being. Know that you are unconditionally loved and very highly respected. Love you. Hi, Mommy. I love you. And I want to close out my statement by saying, Akuna Matata, you know, no one loves this. And I love you, love you, love you, love you. All right? I love you and everyone there. And I hope everything will be going well from now and for future days and years to come. Hope to see you guys soon. That's my tribe. That's your big son. Yeah, that's my tribe. That's JP. You, that's you your got first me. Snapchat. That's my first son. Yeah, JP is um, my first son, and Debbie is um, my my my. She's known me since I was six months. Mm -hmm. So Debbie's almost like a second mommy to me. So you got me. Mm -hmm. You you got me. I want to talk a little bit about greens. We're, yes. We're gonna have to go to break soon. Denver, who we call greens, because mm -hmm. that's his favorite color. Um, I remember you said when when people realized that you and Denver were together. Yeah. A lot of people were saying to him, do you know? Yeah, do you know who she is? What, what are you doing? What are you getting into? Yeah, but he's, he's <laughs> he one of the said, best things that could have ever yeah, happened Yeah, I him. mean, in that moment, I think he said at that time, well, do you know what makes her laugh or makes her cry? Like, at this point, when we, when persons realized we were dating, we were friends for a year before, so we were cultivating, like, a real friendship, you know? Um, and so... As soon as it evolved to our relationship, I mean, I know the word just kind of spread fast, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, yeah, and he was just like, you know, do you know what makes her tick? You know, let me find out for myself, and then I'll decide. I'm so, so glad. Yeah, he, he's been he such had my back, man. Fantastic for us. In yeah, your life. and the two of we are very similar. Like persons think that it's we swing. Denver is. Crazy. My equal is crazy. all I can say. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Um, crazy good. Yeah. And very good for you. We have one more message for you before oh, okay. we, um, we had to break. Take it away, producer. Kerry, what are you going? They tell me to come on here and say a little something about you. Um, mind you, I don't know how I can say a little something about you, but then I'm asking myself to try to do it. So, what can I say about you, Kerry? Talented, funny, compassionate. Hugely engaging, inspiration, powerful, just loving, nurturing, when you're ready, um, which is practically all the time. Kerry, um, I've been blessed to be part of that circle that you've chosen every day to be, to, to, to witness your journey. And it's been an honor to be a witness and to be there with you, to be there all these years. Thank you so much for being amazing. Thank you for putting yourself in a position to where you always want to be the best at everything that you do. And you just, you end up doing it. Everything that you take, you pour yourself into and you're amazing at it. And then in all of that, you, you exhibit such humility every time. I love the fact that in everything that you do, you, you keep on learning. You know you need to learn, you keep on learning, you keep on being better and better. Definitely as a sister, I mean, you've taken care of your sibling, siblings in so many ways. Kerry, um, you know, there's so many things I can say about you, but let me just say this. Your, your bravery inspires me. Your nurturing inspires me. You have touched all of us in the inner circle to try to be better than we are before. Your insistence on making yourself accountable tells us to be accountable. But I just have to say, thank you, Kerry, for being who you are, being amazing. We love you. Keep on doing what you're doing. We'll have your back in everything that you're doing. And just, you know, gracias. Chasing <laughs> <Jason> on. <laughs>
And I don't love in your circle, girl. Yeah. 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 These people have been with me that chase and all my four I, I call my bigger brother, yeah. who's been around me since I was eight. And that's where I started, you know. <clears throat> dabbling well that used to own a sound system but Jason used to own changes and so I was a box girl for many years mm -hmm. I started which playing. is how you got into yeah, music which is how I got into music yeah, yeah. Um, well the music has been a part of your saving as have all these folks yeah in your circle and yeah. so you've been through it yeah. but you've been blessed and I've been it. blessed and that's why I've been able to go through because as we we're saying to you in our discussion that as much as you might hear the story and it might sound like oh my god it's been so much and I've always had people there. Mm -hmm. I've always had angels around me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that whatever you pay attention to multiplies in your life. Whatever you give thanks for multiplies in your life. So when I see my angels, I always give thanks for them. And that's pretty much how I've been able to get through. It's not yeah. just through sheer strength alone. It's through love. Yeah. Love just being given. Right. And I'm not afraid to be a basket case and honest about who I am and where I am in life. So I always tend to attract persons who are there who can see me in all my vulnerability my rawness and still love me through yeah. it yeah. wow all right well let's take this break and come back put a lid on the show for yeah. this week mm. all right everybody putting a lid on our show for this week you've written a book yes. Um, it's called Discovering You, The Search Is Over. Yeah. Does that mean that you've discovered you and the search is over? Um, you know what? There's so many layers. But what I meant in that book was once you start on a particular journey, then it's automatic that you're going to continue discovering yourself, which was the whole purpose of that book. Um, and for me, the search continues. It's not like every day I get up, you know, like, you know, people have this impression that persons who are, you know, have gone through a lot or have made it, you know, have it all together and are powerful. And no, it's breadfruit day today and then superwoman day tomorrow and you go through. Um, and then having gone through as much trauma as I have, I have to be very aware not to fall into the ruts, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because depression is something that mm -hmm. you can sink in really easily without realizing it and stuff but um, I hold myself to a, a high standard because my whole desire is to be the best version of myself before I die like that's just it so I'm not taking any chances mm -hmm. I have to be the best version of myself before I die so I've, I've done a lot of the work and um, for me coming across neuroscience and you know the, the whole world of spirituality and just that evolution has certainly helped to solidify where I am so you've done, you've um, done therapy yeah yeah, okay, yeah. everybody. Yes. I, I, oh, I'm yes. a big advocate of therapy. Yeah. I talk about it a yeah. lot on this show. Only, only, and you know, here's the thing. I mean, and you just there's no there are no stigmas needed about therapy because the truth of the matter is, if you have a wound, if you get cut and it's a bad enough cut, you have to go to the doctor. You know what I mean? And they're going to dress that wound until it's healed, and then you're going to be fine. A lot of us are walking around with emotional and mental scars, yes, and it's festering. You know yes, what I mean? And we're just trying. It's so funny because we try to project this image that we have it all together, and the more you try to do that is the more you crumble because it's the more pressure you're putting on and yourself the more and, the and the more infected the wound becomes. Yes. So for me, um, I'm responsible for my journey. I'm responsible for my life now. My parents, I can't hold them accountable for the rest of my life because they didn't know any better. You know what I mean? Their parents didn't know any better. And so it has to stop with someone and I'm choosing for it to stop with me. So you, you've done the work through therapy. You've written mm -hmm. the book, which I'm so sure was therapeutic as well. Yeah, yeah that book is actually for GP. Mm -hmm. You also discovered faith as a healer. Mm -hmm. You actually got baptized. I did. Um, I you do. tell me that your journey has evolved somewhat mm -hmm. with yeah. your faith. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about um, that. So for me, a broken mind and a broken person who is a Christian is still a broken person who is a Christian. So whether you're a pastor, um, whether you are, a, a, I don't know, a, a bad man who just now decides to find God, whatever it is, if you're a broken person, as much as you can scream on the top of your lungs, Jesus, 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 if you're broken, it's you're broken. not going to help anything. You know what I mean? Outside of you, you're not going to just use religion or your faith to circumvent doing the actual work. And I'm not saying that God can't you know, bestow healing on you. But you're going to have to do the work and the work starts here. So we're spiritual beings. Yes, we have a mind, um, you know, but you have to do the work. So for me, it's not so much about religion. I chose Christianity um, because, of course, that's, that was just something that was speaking to me at the time. But now, for me, it's more of a spiritual journey, just mm -hmm. being aware of that connection. Because how I look at it is, especially through neuroscience, and I want people to really think about this. Years ago, it was said that we, 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 were, we weren't spirit, 
spiritual beings, we're just human. However, years later, science now proves when we die, an energy field lingers in the room. And I ask people, what's that energy that's lingering in the room? That means that that energy is what keeps us alive. Yeah, the heart keeping us alive. Yeah, the brain has its functions. But After we're gone. We are, yeah, we're spirit. spiritual We're beings. spiritual beings having a human experience. Where are you now in your life? We Where am I now in my yes. life? Are you good? Are you happy? Are you working? See, I, you know? I know. It keeps on going, right? <laughs> it keeps on going. Yeah. So every day, like, I'm at, I'm at a good place in my life. You know what I mean? It's just that I'm now, let me tell you, people, everything is layers. Yeah. It's never one thing Not until linear. you die yeah? yeah so I've had a good stretch of being complacent you know in that growth and then now I'm being required to grow some more stretching and I'm going, yes and I'm stretching again it's you always stretch I don't know why people have this concept of you get it and ta-da you walk around or you float everywhere you go oh, please no don't do that we're human we're flawed but we're amazing creatures mm -hmm. we're amazing beings and once we're able to tap in to that innate power and work beyond what we've been trained, we're on that journey. And the final thing I'll say is this, every child comes into this world pure. No child is born with an insecurity. No child is born saying, my nose is big, my black, my ugly, I'm not loved, I'm unworthy. All of those things are trained. So when you have a child who is that pure, that powerful, coming in and being trained by their parents, trained by society, trained by the schools, trained by the system, what you're doing essentially is robbing that child of their own divine essence. And when they get older, they have to choose to discover who they are in order to live an authentic life. Or else they're just going to be running off the script of everybody else. Yeah. So it starts from early. Pour into them. Pour in positivity yeah. because that's how you make strong, positive human beings. Thank you, madam. Thank you. For sharing your story. And I love what you um, do in Sim Simmer. Thank you, love. We had a bet that you wouldn't cry, so you owe me. <sighs> Thank you. I didn't sob. I got a little teary-eyed. What is it? We never said sob or teary-eyed. I just said cry. Okay, And you fine. shed tears. So what do I owe you? We'll talk about it off, off the air. No problem. And now, all that's left for us to do is our affirmation. <laughs> she hates to lose. <laughs> affirmation time. right -o. So we have a saying in this country, you see? We're not dead, not dash away. It's a reminder that despite our deepest, darkest, and most disturbing times, the possibility for light to shine through is always there. Art of life is really similar to the art of war, you know, it's strategy, it's strength, it is steering down the precipice knowing that grace will not allow you to fall. And just as it is with war, sometimes you have to fight, not to your death, but for your life. Life storms prove the strength of our anchors. And like the ship, we forget sometimes that we are built to weather the storms, no matter how badly we are tossed and torn. And it may feel easier to give up, but oftentimes what's easiest is not the right thing to do. You build strength by facing what haunts you, supported by those who love you, motivated by what and who you love. Whatever your battle is, I want to reassure you, it will not always be this way. But how will you know how the story ends if you give up now? So tonight we're affirming, I will anchor my soul in hope and hold on because I know my change is coming. That is our soul food for tonight. Thank you again, Kiki for joining us in our safe space. And we will be back here next week with another amazing story of the power of the human spirit. Until then, every blessing. And remember to count your blessings. Night, everybody.